<laughs> That's a great picture, Brian. <clears throat> Good morning. All right, let's start the lecture with, uh, hold on one second. Let's share. Green. All right, good morning. Can everybody see uh, this FET circuits page? Somebody give me a yay. All right, thumbs up. So just as a little recap, we are in chapter 23 dealing with circuits and our most simple circuit basically consists of a battery. A battery supplies the voltage to move electrons already in the wires in a circuit. And think of voltage just as electric pressure. The bigger the electric pressure, the bigger the difference in pressure, the more force there's going to be to move electrons already in the wires. So these wires themselves already have a bunch of electrons already inside that aren't anchored to any particular atom. They're free to move around. So these wires have billions and billions and billions of electrons that are just not anchored to any particular atoms, they're free to move. And let's get this little light bulb set up. Can I rotate that? We get another wire, and then we'll just throw in a switch here. Okay, so before a switch is closed, there's electrons that are free in the they're not moving anywhere in terms of moving from one spot to another. They're just sort of bouncing around randomly. But when I connect a switch, what happens is the battery is now going to supply a voltage, which you can think of as a difference in electric pressure, which causes free electrons in the wires to move. Our big, one of our big equations from this chapter is Ohm's law. And Ohm's law basically says that how much current you get flowing in a circuit is going to equal to how much voltage you connect the circuit to divided by what's called the resistance. So voltage, like I said, you can think of as just electric pressure. The bigger the voltage, the more pressure difference there is to cause charges in the circuits to move. Resistance describes how well an object resists letting current flow through it. A conductor has a low resistance. An insulator has a high resistance. So let me, can I do this little amateur? Let me go back to mouse. So if I look at this battery, let's just set this battery to 10 volts. So that's how much sort of electric pressure that this battery is supplying how much current it produces will depend upon not just the voltage, but also what's called the resistance. And so if I look at this light bulb, this light bulb has a resistance of 10 ohms. So if I wanted to know how much current is flowing through this circuit, so one, these, uh, I can't show you on this, but oh, labels, values. Okay, so wires do have a small resistance, but in this particular animation, it's assuming the wires don't have any resistance. So the total resistance of this whole circuit is just the resistance of the light bulb, which is 10 ohms. So if I wanted to know how much current, and one, let me just go back to this for a second, draw. Current, we write as the letter I. Voltage, we write as the letter V. Resistance, we write as the letter R. So if I wanted to know how much current is flowing in this particular circuit, the voltage we're connecting it to is 10 volts because of the battery. The resistance is 10 ohms. So I take 10 volts divided by 10 ohms, I get one, and the unit of current is amp. So if I were to take an ammeter, and that's basically just a device that measures current, what I would see is the current in this circuit is one amp, and one of the important things about circuits is current is not used up. Meaning if there's one amp flowing out of the battery, there's gonna be one amp flowing into the light bulb, one amp flowing out of the light bulb. So that's just sort of a big little recap is our circuits are things that cause current to move, charge to move. 
battery supplies the force to move charges that are already in the wires. And then as those charges travel through, let's say a light bulb, what ends up happening is it heats up the wires, the light bulb causes it to glow. So let me stop this particular share and then go back to my OneNote to just do a little, little recap. Screen share, let's do this. Open, okay. So just a quick little recap and then we're gonna finish chapter 23. So what I've talked about so far, and let me draw on here, draw, let's use green. So we've talked about what is current. Current is just the flow of electric charge. What, why did that do there? Uh, let me try to erase this. Okay, so current is just the flow of electric charge. It's how many electrons pass through a given point in a given amount of time. We measure current in amps. We talked about voltage. Don't worry about the book definition of voltage, electric potential energy per charge. We are just thinking of voltage as electric pressure. The more electric pressure, the more force there's gonna to be to move charges that are already in the wires of a circuit. Talked a bit about Ohm's law. Like I said, Ohm's law basically says how much current you get depends upon the voltage you connect the circuit to divided by what's called the resistance of the circuit. Wires have a specific resistance, light bulbs have a specific resistance and so on. In terms of resistance, we looked at for a wire, how much resistance a wire has is gonna depend upon three things. One, how thick the wire is. The thicker the wire, the easier it is for charge to flow, which means there's gonna be less resistance. It also depends upon length. The longer the wire, the harder it's gonna be for charges to get from one end to the other, just because there's more space to travel to, which means that it's gonna be harder for charges to get from one end to the other, so more resistance. And the other one is what's called conductivity or the type of wire. Things that have a lower resistance are good conductors like copper or gold or things like that. So if I had two wires at exact same size, exact same length, if one of them is made out of copper, the other one's made out of steel, the copper wires would have less resistance just because copper is a better conductor. And then the last thing was temperature. As things heat up, the atoms and molecules start moving faster, which means it's harder for electrons to flow through the wire. And like I said, we measure resistance in just something called ohms. The bigger the resistance, the less current there's gonna be flowing through the circuit. And that's kind of where I ended up. So what I wanna do is just stop this for one second, open it up to any questions about anything I've covered so far in chapter 23 before I move on to everything else. Alana, question. Um, not so much a question, but can you zoom in again on when you're using the um, notes? Because it's hard to read when you don't zoom in. Great, I can't, you cannot do this. I can't minimize this. Got it. So when I'm showing you the, uh, my one note, zooming in on that. Yeah, yeah. Got it, thank you, I will do that. Okay. Any other questions on what we've covered so far in chapter 23? Okay, so then I want to continue moving forward. Let me share this again. Hold on one second. Okay, we wanna show PowerPoint slides. Okay, let me share this. Share screen, we'll look at PowerPoint, share. Okay, how's that in terms of size, good? Thumbs up. Somebody give me a thumbs up. That's, that's decent size, yeah. Okay, so a question would be, people often ask, what causes shock in the human body? The voltage or the current? And the answer is how much shock you feel or if you get electrocuted or something like that is caused by how much current flows through your body. But how much current flows through your body depends upon two things. One, 
how much voltage you are touching in terms of if I touch uh, outlet or something like that to the resistance of the human body. So it's possible that, let me draw on this again, draw. You could be killed by a 120 volt outlet if the resistance of the human body was low enough, but if your resistance was high enough, you could actually touch a thousand volt potential difference and still be okay. Remember how much current we feel, and again, current is given by the letter I, is equal to the voltage we connect the outlet to, or we, voltage that the circuit is connected to, divided by the resistance. So, just to give you an idea, the resistance of the human body varies greatly. So, the resistance can be as low as about 100 ohms. Let's say if you just ran a marathon and you were completely soaking wet with sweat. Well, actually, this is not a recap anymore. Let's put on our lecture hat. But if you were completely dry, the resistance of the human body could be as much as 500,000 ohms. So just to give you an idea, let's say that you did actually connect or you touched a 120 volt outlet and I wanted to know how much current was flowing through my body. Well, if I touched 120 volts and the resistance was only 100 ohms because I was soaking wet and I just ran a marathon, the current flowing through my body in this case could be as much as 1.2 amps. And as we'll see, just in terms of the overall effect, less than a hundredth of an amp could actually be fatal if it passes through your heart. Now, let's say that for some reason I decided I wanted to touch a thousand volts outlet or something like that. I would never recommend it. But if my resistance was high enough that the resistance of the human body, let's say, was half a million ohms. Let's break, break out a little calculator. A thousand divided by 500,000. We get 0 0.002 amps. So you could touch a thousand volt potential difference and be fine if the resistance of the human body was enough, was big enough, but you would never ever wanna do that. So just in terms of the effect of current on the human body, one thousandth of an amp, 0 0.001 amps, you could feel this. If I increase that by a factor of 5.005 .005 amps, that's when it would start to be painful. If you've ever touched your nine volt battery or your tongue, the amount of current flowing through your tongue is about 0 0.005 amps. If you increase that to a hundredth of an amp, 0 0.01 amps, that would cause involuntary muscle spasms. So if you've ever had like a stim machine, one of those little, oh, I have one downstairs, I should get it. Uh, I don't have time. But if you've ever had a stim machine, like if you've ever gone to a chiropractor, what they do is they basically put these electrodes on your skin, they send a small amount of current from one to the other. That current, if it's strong enough, can cause involuntary muscle spasms. So it actually causes your muscles to clench. If you increase the current to 0 0.015 amps, that would actually cause involuntary muscle control. Meaning, the way we control our muscles is by basically sending an impulse from our brain to our muscles. It's really just a little pulse of electricity that causes our muscles to clench. If I sent current, let's say through my arm, and that current was big enough, 0 0.015 amps, that would cause my arm to basically clench, and I could not unclench my arm by thinking about it. Basically, the current flowing through my hand is enough to cause my hand to clench, and I can't unclench it just by thinking about it because the electricity flowing through my arm is causing it to clench. So if you were to ever see somebody that was, let's say, touching a live wire and they got electrocuted, what you wouldn't want to do is go and try and grab them and pull them off because that's going to cause you to clench on them also. What you probably want to do is just do like a flying karate kick and try and <laughs> kick them off the wire. And then 0 0.07 amps, if it passed through the heart, would probably be fatal if it lasted for more than a second. So whether or not people get electrocuted generally depends upon how the current is flowing. You could have a ton of currents, let's say flowing from your elbow out your hand, 
And that current can cause muscle damage. It could fry your muscles, something like that, but it probably wouldn't be fatal. What's fatal is if current flows through your heart. So if I touched my hand with, let's say, a live wire that had a lot of electricity flowing through it, and I touched another wire or the ground, if the current flows from one hand to another, then it's going to pass through my heart, and that's when it can be fatal. Okay, so that's just a bit about the effects of current on the human body. A thousandth, a thousandth, a thousandth, a thousandth of an amp can be felt. About five one thousandths is painful. And then as you go up from there, you can have involuntary muscle spasms. And if it passes through the heart, it could be fatal. Okay. Other thing I want to talk about a little bit is just the difference between direct current and alternating current. Direct current is basically produced something by something like a battery. In direct current, you always have charges flowing the exact same way. So if I have just a simple circuit with a battery, a light bulb, and some wires, the current is always electrons flowing from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. They're always, always, always flowing in the same direction. So direct current is produced by batteries and electrons are always flowing from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. That's always how it works for direct current for a battery, electrons being in a sense repelled from the negative terminal, attracted to the positive terminal. Now, when you plug something into an outlet, what you get out of the outlet is what's called alternating current. And in alternating current, the electrons are constantly changing the direction that they're moving. And in fact, in North America, what we have is what's called 120 volts, so that's how much voltage we're getting out of the outlets and 60 hertz. You don't need to worry too much about the 60 hertz, but what that means is 60 times a second, the electrons change directions. So they're moving in one way for a 60th of a second, then they move back the other way, then they move this way, then they move back. They're constantly moving back and forth. So alternating current, this is usually created by, let's say, generators. If you were to use a generator or pretty much any outlets that you plug something into, you're always getting alternating current. And let me stop this for one second. Let me just show you, if I can, a quick little thing on how alternating current is created. Uh, let me share this for one second. Screen share. Okay, so I don't know if you know this. Well, let me ask you a quick question. What's the difference between a nuclear power plant and a coal power plant? Does anybody know the big difference between when we're creating electricity, what the difference between a nuclear power plant is and just a normal power plant like Moss Landing? Anybody? i give you the answer. The answer is all power plants basically work the same way is they're boiling water to create steam. The steam rises, and as it rises, it basically turns a turbine, which is a bunch of wires connected together in a really strong magnetic field. So this is just a very simple, simple model of it. But what's happening is you've got a bunch of wires in a strong magnetic field that are moving in a circular path. They're basically being rotated. And as the amount of magnetic field, which we haven't gotten into yet, but as the amount of magnetic field in a wire changes, it changes the amount of current that the wire produces. And so all power plants basically work the same way. They're rotating a big coil of wire in a strong magnetic field that creates alternating current. But the difference between a nuclear power plant and a coal power plant is just the fuel that they're using to boil water, to cause steam, to cause turbines to rotate. Okay, you don't really need to know all that. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about alternating current. So let me stop this and just open it up for a second. So batteries produce direct current, which means electrons are always flowing in the same direction. They flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal in a battery. 
alternating current is what you get out of an outlet or if you pl plug something into a generator. And in alternating current, the electrons are constantly changing direction. They move in one direction for a short amount of time and they move in the other direction and they keep going back and forth. And that's the way alternating current works. So let me pause just for a minute, open it up for questions about alternating current, direct current, or the effect of current on the human body. Going once, going twice. I have a question. Anna. Yes. Um, I was wondering, like, is there a specific benefit to having an alternating current? Is there a reason why generators have an alternating current instead of a direct current? Uh, the answer is yes, and let me just say that alternating current is much easier to produce and transport over long distances. I haven't actually seen this yet, but there's a movie that came out called The Current War that I wanted to see. In the beginning, there was a whole debate about when they were first producing electricity about whether we should go to direct current or alternating current. And there was a big battle between Edison and uh, Tesla and some other people. And anyway, it ends up that alternating current is easier to produce and it's easier to transport over long distance using power lines and things like that. So that's the simple answer is if I have a strong magnet and I can spin wires in it, it's easy to create alternating current and alternating current is much easier to transport over long distances. So one little interesting thing to think about, I was just doing this as we were driving around the other day, every single house, every single building has to have power lines coming to it. And they're so ubiquitous that we barely even notice them anymore. But next time you're driving cross country, driving on the five or on the one or something like that, you have to have these power lines basically going to every single property that needs to They're everywhere. Just kind of a cool little thought. All right, any other questions before we move on to series and parallel circuits? Going once, going twice. All right. So what I created for you is a couple different circuits so that we can look at this together. So let me get rid of this voltage thing for a second, get rid of this current for a second, and share the screen. Why can't I? Share screen, circuits, share. OK, so can everybody see this uh, circuits? applet here. I'm assuming you can. Let me open this up. I got a couple different switches. Now, remember our most basic simple circuit is just a battery connected to a single light bulb. And maybe I've got a switch. Well, it's very rare just to have one device connected together by itself. In general, what we usually have are multiple vice devices connected together. How do I get rid of this? Clear all drawings. Let me make this smaller for a second, mouse. And the way that you connect multiple devices together, there's a couple different ways. One of them is called series, and the other one is called parallel. The way I think about series is, in a series connection, there's only one path for electrons to flow. In this case, when I close both switches, now I'm going to have electrons flowing from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal. And they're always flowing in this same direction. One of the things we're going to see, though, about series circuits is anytime I have an open circuit where basically I don't have a complete path, no current is going to flow. So if I were to break one of these switches, once current stops flowing in one section of a circuit that's connected in series, it stops flowing in all sections. So if I were to connect three things, let's say three light bulbs in series, Here's 
basically what you're doing is you've got one light bulb, second light bulb, third light bulb, and any time current stops flowing in one, let's say one of the light bulbs burned out, now there's an open circuit and current stops flowing everywhere. On the other hand, the second way of connecting three things together, whoa, what's this thing doing down here? Is called parallel. And let me just show you what it'll look like in a circuit diagram. So I've got a battery. And in this case, I have three different paths for current to flow. So in this diagram, I didn't draw the switches, but here's the nice thing about things in parallel is every device behaves independently. So if I wanna turn on one mouse, I have this one path for charge to flow. If I turn on another one, I've got a second path for charge to flow. If I turn on the third one, now I've got a third path. But the nice thing about things in parallel is they all behave independently. I can turn one thing on without having to have them all turned on. On the other hand, if we're talking about, let me clear this drawing. If I'm talking about things in series, if I were to disconnect one light bulb or turn it off, now what I have in essence is an open circuit. There's not gonna be any charge flowing anywhere in the circuit. So here's an interesting thing. If your house was connected in series, then you would have to have every electrical appliance on at the exact same time in order to run anything. Because as soon as I say, let's turn off one light bulb. So anytime you're turning on or off a light switch, in essence, what you're really doing is completing a circuit to turn on the light or opening the circuit to turn it off. Current will only flow if there's a complete path without any gaps in it. So in this case, once I close it, now I've got current flowing through all three light bulbs. Where in the other case, for a parallel circuit, I have three different paths that current can flow through. So let's just say I close this middle one. Well, this path right here is open. And so I'm not gonna have any current flowing there. This path right here is open. So I'm not gonna have any current flowing there. But this path is closed. I have a complete path for current to flow in this direction here. And so this is how our houses are basically set up. If I want to turn on the microwave, I don't have to also have the coffee pot on and the toaster on and things like that. I can turn on the microwave. I can turn on my coffee maker. I can make a smoothie. I'm done with the smoothie, I turn off the blender. I'm done with the toaster. Every single thing behaves independently when you connect devices together in parallel. All right, so let me stop this and then go to OneNote. Uh, series circuits. Okay, so again, oh, I didn't share that. Share screen. Okay, so again, here is the picture of what it looks like for three things to be connected together in the series. So I'll go back and show you the lecture notes in a second, but some of the key things for things connected together in series is the current through each device is the same. Meaning, let me uh, draw here. However much current flows into this light bulb is the same amount of current that flows into this light bulb, which is the same amount of current that flows into this light bulb. So in a series circuit, current only has one path in which to flow. And it's always electrons which are flowing from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. Here's the other thing about things connected together in series. And again, I'll go to my notes and show you all this in a second. One, let's say one of these light bulbs burned out. If a light bulb burns out, now I have an open circuit. 
I'm not going to have any current flowing anywhere. So if these were things in our house, like I said, turning on an on and off switch is the same thing as just opening up the circuit or closing the circuit. When it's closed, there's a complete path for current to flow. You'll have charge flowing. But when it's open, you're not going to have any charge flowing. So if one of these things did burn out somehow, then current would stop flowing everywhere in the circuit. This is not what you want for a house. Like I said, if things in our house were connected together in series, everything would have to be on at the same time in order for anything to work. The other big thing is, if I think about resistance, is let's say how hard is it for an electron to get from here all the way around to the other end? Well, the more light bulbs something has to pass through, the harder it is to get from one end to another. I like to think about this as let's say you're going through a subway. In series would be if I had a bunch of turnstiles that I had to pass through. The more turnstiles I have to pass through, the harder it's gonna be for me to get where I'm going. On the other hand, parallel. In parallel, I have multiple paths for current to flow. So for example, let me, are these the batteries backwards? Okay, so this battery is just set up a little bit backward. Generally, the smaller line is the negative terminal, bigger line is a positive. So in this particular setup, I have three separate paths for current to flow. I could have current flowing through this first light bulb. I could have current flowing through this second light bulb. And I can have current flowing through this third light bulb. And the thing is, each one of these paths is independent. If I now go and close this switch, now I'm gonna have current have a path to go in this direction. If I then close this switch, now current's gonna have a path to go in there. The thing about this is, and this is a little weird to understand, but as I add more silly, decreasing the overall resistance of the circuit. Why is that? Well, again, let's imagine we're going through a subway and instead of having three turnstiles back to back to back that people have to pass through, now I open up three turnstiles side by side so more people can get through. In this case, if I have more paths that current can flow through, it's gonna be easier for current to get from one end to the other. Okay, so let's go and look at these lecture notes and kind of go through this. So series, again, these are still relatively simple circuits, but if I'm going to connect more than one device to a battery, there's multiple ways of doing it. One of those ways is what's called series. And the way I think of series is there's only one path for electrons to flow. There is no choice. So here, let me make this bigger. Here would be three light bulbs connected in series to a six volt battery. So I've got one bulb, two bulbs, three bulbs. Three things to really keep in mind about things connected together in series. One, the current is the same through each device. I can't have electrons just building up somewhere in a wire. They're all sort of traveling in the same direction. Any current that passes through one bulb has to then pass through the other bulbs. It doesn't build up in a circuit. Two, the total resistance is the sum of the resistance from each device. Meaning if each one of these light bulbs, let's say had a resistance of 10 ohms. If I have three light bulbs connected together in series, the total resistance is I add up the resistances of all those devices. So big thing to remember is more devices, devices in series, more resistance. More resistance means less current is going to flow. So as I add more and more devices together in series, the overall resistance goes up, which means the overall current goes down. So more devices in series means less current flows in the circuit. But here's two big things that are really a disadvantage. One, if one device burns out, current stops flowing through all devices and not just burns out, but is turned off.
So if I have three things connected together in series, every single one must be on at the exact same time in order for any of them to work. I turn off one, they all turn off. And the other thing is the total voltage of the battery is gonna be split among the individual devices. Meaning, if this is a six volt battery, it ends up in series, each one of those has to end up sharing the total voltage of the battery. So if these were identical light bulbs, this light bulb would have two volts across it, this one would have two volts, and this one would have two volts. They would all have to split the voltage. So that's not ideal, especially in our house, all electrical devices are meant to run at 120 volts. If I connected 10 devices together in series, they would all have to share that 120 volts. Now, the other way of connecting multiple devices together is what's called parallel. And the way I think about parallel is there are multiple paths for current to flow. So I have current that can flow through this first light bulb. I have current that can flow through the second light bulb and I have current that can flow through this third light bulb. Some of the important characteristics of things connected together in parallel. One, they do not split the voltage. They get the exact same voltage, and that voltage is gonna be whatever the battery is. So in this particular case, this light bulb is going to have six volts across it. Same thing with every single light bulb. So again, going back to series, in series, they have to split the total voltage of the battery. So if I have three things connected together in series to a six volt battery, each one is getting only two volts. But in parallel, each one, each battery ultimately, or I'm sorry, each light bulb is ultimately connected to the ends of the battery. So this guy right here, that first light bulb is connected to the ends of the battery, it's getting six volts. This second one, is also connected to the ends of the battery. It's getting six volts and so on. So each device in parallel gets the same voltage as the battery. Now, here's the thing that's sort of interesting. As I connect more devices in parallel, I actually decrease the overall resistance of the circuit. And again, that's because the more paths I have to take, the easier it's gonna be for electrons to get from one end to the other, in this case, because they have three different paths that they can take. But here's how people overload their circuits is, you know, let's say in your kitchen, you have multiple devices you wanna to connect together. Well, just those little two outlets, it's not gonna do it. So you get one of those uh, thingamajiggies that turn two outlets into six outlets, and then you do that to another one. So now you're plugging in five or six or seven or eight or nine things to the same outlet. Every time I connect something else in parallel, what I'm doing is I'm decreasing the overall resistance of the circuit, which means more current's gonna flow overall. And if too much current flows in a circuit, that's when you can trip the circuit breaker or overload a circuit because our household wires, our devices are only meant to carry a certain amount of current. So what ends up happening is the other nice thing is one, if one device burns out, current still flows in the other devices. So each one of these light bulbs behaves completely independently of the other. I can turn one of them on without having to turn them all on. And let me uh, stop this for a second. Stop this share, I'll just do new share. Go back to this construction kit again. Okay, so just going back to series and parallel one more time. Why is this? So notice, I opened up the switch. So now that I have an open circuit, current stops flowing everywhere. So like if this was a, this is a 10 volt battery, if these light bulbs are all identical, each one of these light bulbs is actually going to be getting one third of the voltage of the battery. So the voltage across this one, once it's connected, would only be 3.3 volts. Same thing with the voltage across each one. The big disadvantage of things connected in series, like I said, is once I open the switch or one of these devices burns out, current stops flowing everywhere. Whereas for a, 
parallel circuit. Every single device behaves independently. So I can have this light bulb on, I can have both light bulbs on, I can have three light bulbs on, I can turn one off without the other one going on, so and things like that. So one, let me just show you something. So this is a 10 volt battery. These light bulbs have resistances of 10 ohms. So one, when a switch is open, it's pretty much like having an infinite resistance. Basically, current cannot flow through an open circuit. So you can see once I close it, now we're imagining these wires don't have any resistance, but in reality they do. So what I wanted to show you was each one of these light bulbs has 10 volts of resistance. The battery itself is 10 volts. So if I want to know how much current's going to flow in a light bulb, it's going to be the voltage 10 volts divided by the resistance 10 ohms. I'm going to get one amp. So if I look right here, I have a current of one amp flowing through this section of the wire. Well, now let's say I turn on this light bulb. Now there's also going to be one amp flowing through this part of the wire, this light bulb, which means that I have two amps coming out of the battery because I've got one amp of current which is flowing up here, and I have one amp which is flowing in this direction, which means I have to have two amps coming out of the battery. Well, what happens if I then connect another device in parallel? Well, now this device is going to have one amp going through it. This light bulb has one amp going through it. This light bulb has one amp going through it which means the current now coming out of the battery is three amps. So if I were to then connect another light bulb and another light bulb and another light bulb in parallel, every time I connect a new thing in parallel, I'm gonna have current flowing through that device also, which is gonna increase the total current in the entire circuit. And if I do that too much, I can overload a circuit. Woo! Okay, what I wanna do is stop we are pretty much done chapter 23. What I want to do is just spend maybe like five minutes asking a couple of clicker questions and then seeing if you have any questions. So actually, I forgot, I put the clicker questions on OneNote. Uh, so let's do a couple clicker questions. Share screen, OneNote, share. Okay, uh, let's do a couple. First question, one to think about, I wanna give you just 30 seconds. Modern automobile headlights are connected in series, parallel, <laughs> perpendicular, or none of these. Okay, whoever just circled parallel, how do you know? What's your evidence? Um, when, one or when one headlight goes out, the other one doesn't go out as well. Exactly. And notice I said in this question, uh, let me get through this draw, modern automobile headlights. They were not always connected in parallel. They used to be connected in series. Anytime things are connected in series, if one thing burns out, they all go out. And so if you had headlights connected together in series, if one of them burns out, the other one would go out. Obviously, that's not a good idea. So now, automobile headlights are connected in parallel. And the reason you know that is because oftentimes you will see cars with just one headlight on. If they had things connected in series, if one went out, the other one would go out. So modern automobile headlights are connected in parallel so that when one light burns out, the other one still works. Okay, let's do a couple other ones. Uh, how about question three? So what is the effect on the current in a wire if the voltage across the wire is doubled and the resistance is cut in half? Current decreases by four, decreases by two, stays the same, increases by two, increases by four. Take about 30 seconds, think about that. So keep in mind, this is 
Ohm's law. Basically says how much current I get, which we write as capital I. And just so you know, I don't know why we use I for current. Voltage is V, resistance is R. Things to keep in mind, the bigger the voltage, the bigger the current. So if I were to double the voltage, I would double the current, but the bigger the resistance, the smaller the current. If I have more resistance, I have less current, less resistance, more current. Uh, Suki, I'll get to your question in one second. So if I were to just double the voltage, if I double the voltage just by itself, that would double the current. If I just cut the resistance in half, if I decrease the resistance, the current goes up. So if I decrease the resistance by half, the current would double. But if I do both at the same time, if I double the voltage and I cut the resistance in half, both of those would end up doubling the current. So the overall answer is my current is gonna increase by a factor of four. It increases by a factor of two because I'm doubling the voltage, increases by a factor of two because I'm cutting the resistance in half. Overall is two times two is four. Okay, let me just check out this chat. Why can't I see chat? Uh, oh, Suki, never mind. Okay, uh, let me pause. Questions on either of those two clicker questions? Gone once, gone twice. All right, let's do one or two more. Okay, here's a trickier one for you. This is question two. Uh, why can't I go back to draw? So question two says, the voltage across the ends of a wire is doubled. Which one of the following statements concerning the resistance of the wire is true? The resistance decreases by four, decreases by two, is not changed, increases by a factor of two, increases by a factor of four. What do you think? So I've got a wire, let's say initially it's connected to five volts, now I connect it to 10 volts. What's gonna happen to the resistance of the wire? What do you think? And let's think about this resistance of a wire. We saw that it basically depends upon a few different things. One of them is the thickness of the wire. Thicker wires have less resistance. Thinner wires have more resistance. It depends upon the length of the wire. The longer the wire is, the more resistance it has. The shorter the wire, the less resistance. It depends upon the type of wire or the conductivity. Copper wires in general have less resistance than steel wires, and it also depends upon the temperature. So if we assume that the temperature doesn't change, which is not a completely realistic example because anytime the current changes, the temperature will change slightly. But key to this question is emphasizing that the resistance of a wire only depends upon properties of the wire, not what you connect the wire to. So the best answer in this case is the resistance is not changed because I'm not changing the thickness of the wire or the length of the wire or the type of wire. And if the temperature doesn't change, then the resistance won't change. Now, if it heats up, then the resistance would go up a little bit because resistance of a wire does depend upon temperature. All right, and... Uh, Uh, let's do one more, and then I will uh, kind of end this and then maybe do 15, 20 minutes of office hours in a second. So two lamps, one with a thick filament and one with a thin filament are connected in series. So one, just what do they mean by a filament? Uh, all light bulbs basically have a wire in it. And that wire is what we call the filament. And just so you know, what happens is as current is flowing through the filament, the temperature of the filament is high. It reaches thousands of degrees and it basically glows white hot. So imagine I had two light bulbs connected together. One of them has a thick filament 
and th this is really just the wire. Thick filament basically means less resistance. The other one has a thin filament, which basically means more resistance. So if I had two light bulbs connected together in series, and let's just say one of this, this one had more resistance because it had a thinner filament, and this one had less resistance because it had a thicker filament. Which one would have the greater current in it? The thick filament, the thin filament, or the current with the same? So would more it be the one? Uh, hold on one sec. So more resistance means this is a uh, thin filament. This is a thick filament. So this is kind of a trick question. Anything connected together in series has to have the same current. Now, if one of them has more resistance than the other, what matters in things connected in series is the overall resistance of the circuit as a whole. So if things are connected in series, remember electrons flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, any electrons flowing through one light bulb have to flow through the other. Electrons don't build up in the circuit or just hang out in the wire. Anything flowing past one point has to eventually flow through past another point. So the current is going to be the same through each lamp. Booyah! Okay, so that's kind of it. We are done chapter 23. And just as a quick little reminder for myself, uh, Joe's do, 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 physics 10, uh, Thursday, Friday. Okay. So just as a little, uh, preview of the schedule this Thursday, chapter 23 homework is due and it's due by 8 59 PM. And then Friday, quiz on chapter 23. And again, by 8.59 p.m., I'm going to send out an email reminder, but all times listed in Mastering Physics are Eastern Standard Time. Pacific Time is three hours earlier. So even though it says the due date is 11.59 p.m., it's 11.59 East Coast Time, 8.59 California Time. So we kind of went over uh, what it's supposed to have office hours, uh, 10.15 to 10.45. Tell you what, I'm going to stop this. I need to just get a little bit of food. I'm going to restart this in about five minutes for office hours. Let me chat. Thank you. Thank you to everybody before I end this Zoom. Any last minute questions that I can answer? Let me stop this share. Are, are we going to snap out? <laughs> uh, you know you're right i should be snapping in and snapping out i gotta do that all right so if we're all good for now i'm gonna open up this meeting again in about five minutes just for office hours if anybody has any questions uh all right let's let it go Woo! i didn't hear any snapping <laughs> Woo -hoo! all right have a wonderful uh day and I'm gonna open up this meeting again in five minutes in case anybody has any questions for office hours. And